We welcome you all to our evening uh, study of the scriptures. And today's topic, as you would have noticed from the uh, creative which I sent, is watching our life and doctrine. Now, this is what the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. I want to give a background to this particular uh, statement of Paul. Now, Timothy actually <clears throat> was an elder in the church in Ephesus when Paul wrote to him. He was a young man, by nature very timid and intimidated by the elders in the church. Uh, he, his, uh, he was a part of a mixed marriage. His father was a Greek. His mother was a Jewess, Eunice. Grandmother was Lois. They are both believers. But uh, he was a Jewish uh, mother and a, a Greek father. He was born in Lystra. And uh, he became a believer in Lystra and uh, became a spiritual son of the Apostle Paul. And because he was half Greek and half Jew, he was not, wasn't accepted by either of them, probably. That's what sort of happened in mixed marriages. And Paul uh, had him circumcised, even though he was, had a Greek father, had him circumcised so that the Jews would accept him as one of them. And then he was in Ephesus, and he was gifted in many areas, specifically preaching and teaching. And uh, Paul had laid hands upon him to receive gifts. So also the church, the elders in the church, but because of the intimidation of the uh, elders in the church, probably, he was neglect neglecting the gift. He was not actually exercising the gift. And Paul wrote to him as a pastoral letter to encourage him and not to be looked down upon because he's young. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he writes, Not that anyone look down upon you because you're young. We set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. I'm sure many people in the churches today can easily resonate with this because so often they get intimidated by certain people in the churches, especially young people in the church, they get intimidated by the elders in the church. But then he said, don't let them look down because they're young. But rather, set an example for the believers in speech, life, love, faith, and purity. Five different attributes or are required for us to be emulating, that no one looked down upon us because of our age or whatever, but rather be examples to people. Speech and life, that is basically doctrine, speech coming from doctrine and life. So he's writing to Timothy and saying, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. If you do, you will save yourself and your hearers. So this, I'm sure all of us can relate to this. It's very important that we are constantly alert and watch our life and doctrine closely. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, If you think you're standing firm, be careful you don't fall. If you think you're standing firm, doesn't mean you're standing firm. You think you're standing firm. People say, oh, you're so wonderful Christian, you're so wonderful, your God has blessed you so much. Sometimes we think we are very strong, that's a time very vulnerable. And therefore, always our trust must be on God's capacity to keep us secure in Him. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah 7, chapter verse 9, is written, If you don't stand firm in faith, you won't stand at all. If you don't stand firm in faith, you will not stand at all. And faith is a gift of God. How wonderful to know that the Lord is the author and perfecter of faith. He will sustain our faith. And we have put our faith in Him to sustain our faith. So I'm going to look at two aspects. One is life, other is doctrine. Uh, life and doctrine. And uh, our life that we live should be, first of all, pleasing to God. As just now, Rowan sang a song based on the book of Exodus, 30th chapter, verse 13, where God had told Moses he had found favor in God's sight. And the response was, if I have found favor in your sight, teach me your ways that I might know you and continue to find favor with you. He's basically having a passion to be favorable to God, to please God, not to please people. Pleasing people is secondary to pleasing God. As we please God, we are the favor of some people. Some will love us, some will hate us. Some will accept us, some will reject us. That doesn't matter. What matters is, are we living a life that pleases God? 
So watching our life basically means letting God reveal our life to us that he is pleased with that life. And if he says he's pleased with us, what should we say, Lord? Teach me your ways that I might know you and continue to find favor with you. Now, it's very important for us to let the Lord reveal to us everything about us. We are called to be a people who are holy and blameless in his sight. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, He chose us in before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So when we talk about watching our life, is our life pleasing to God? Is God happy with the way we live? Very often I share about how, how we are pleasing to God. We are all pleasing to God because of who we are. We are purchased by the blood of Jesus. We belong to Him. Bought by His blood. And because He paid a very great price to purchase us, we are very precious to Him. In uh, the book of Zephaniah 3.17 we read, it's written, The Lord is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. We are so precious to God. We are delight of God because of who we are. Also, God delights in doing wonderful things to us. In the book of Jeremiah, 32nd chapter, 40, 41, we read, God says, I will never stop doing good to them. Them meaning, reference here is New Testament believers. New Testament believers. Where he says in verse 38, they'll be, me, they'll be my people, I'll be their God. I'll make an everlasting covenant with them. That covenant is, everlasting covenant is the blood covenant through Christ. And Lord says, I will never stop doing good to them. Verse 41, I will delight in doing good to them. I'll inspire them to fear me. So God finds great delight in doing good to us. In fact, he does what is best for us. I'm going to speak on Thursday on discerning what is best. God's will for us is the best. His will or desire for us is the best. Discern what is best is going to speak on Thursday. But today we're going to speak about how God finds great delight in doing what is best for us. Thirdly, he delights in teaching us about himself. If you look at uh, Luke chapter 10. After seven disciples come back driving, after driving out demons, they're full of joy and excitement. They tell Jesus, demons submit us in your name. The Lord tells them, don't rejoice because demons submit you, rejoice their names in the book of life. Verse 21 is written, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, tells the Father, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You have written these things, wise and learned, and revealed to children, for this was your good pleasure. Revealing mysteries to children or people who are like children, God finds pleasure in it. He delights in it. So all that is wonderful for us to know we belong to him. That's what is best for us. He teaches himself about himself to us. But the question is, are we pleasing to God by the way we live. The Lord gave a very simple formula to recognize his people. And his people as compared to false people. You'll know them by the fruit. Matthew 7, 16. He told them, many will come to you as wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolves in sheep's clothing. You'll know them by the fruit. So as we live for the Lord and live a life that pleases God, God will make us a display of his splendor. So how do we watch our life? Very simple. We have a counselor, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us. He is a counselor. He will counsel us when we tend to go away from God. He will reveal our hearts to us. Now when you talk about being pleasing to God and holy and blameless in his sight, you must understand how he sees. What does God see in believers to examine our lives? Seven things he sees. I've shared that before also, but I want to say that in passing because the context is uh, pleasing God through our lives. What he sees. 
Seven things he sees. He examines our hearts. First Samuel 16, 7. He told Samuel, when he thought that El elder son Eliab was a chosen one to be king of Israel, he tells him, don't cut up his night. God doesn't look at things man looks at. Man is out of appearance. God looks at the heart. I see the hearts of people. So God examines our hearts. People don't know our hearts, but God knows the hearts. Number one, our hearts he examines. Number two, he obviously knows what we do. Our actions he sees. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 6, he examines our actions. Nothing is hidden from God. Fourth chapter of uh, Hebrews, verse 13 says, Nothing not written from God's side. If the uncovered laid bare before the eyes of him, to whom we have been given account. Everything he sees. He examines our hearts. He sees our actions. He knows our thoughts. Psalm 94 verse 11. God knows the thoughts of man. He knows they are futile. What we think he knows. People don't know what we think. But the Lord knows what we think. He knows what we speak. He examines the words we speak. Malachi, 3rd chapter, 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to each other. The Lord listened and heard. The Lord listened and heard. Everything we say, he knows. He's got a record. He said, he heard. And a scroll written down. Scroll written down, probably by the angels who look after us. Every word we speak is noted down. Nothing is erased unless we repent of wrong words. If then it's erased, of course. But if we don't, <clears throat> it's all recorded. So our hearts, he knows. Our actions. Our thinking. Our words. Number five, examines the motivation behind our thoughts. What makes us think what we think? In First Chronicles 28, chapter verse 9, David tells Solomon, And you, my son Solomon, acclaim the God of the Father, serve with the whole heart, devotion, and a willing mind. For you know the Lord tests every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. What makes us think what we think? He just doesn't examine our thoughts. He examines the motivation behind our thoughts. What makes us think what we think? Number five. Number six, he examines the motivation behind our actions. Proverbs 16.2 All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. We do a lot of good for people we do as Christians. Do a lot of good in the church, outside the church. What's the motivation? Is it to bless people and glorify God or to get a name for ourselves? Personal gain, personal agenda. Actions are very good. What's the motivation behind that? Number seven, is that what the motivation behind the good words we speak? When you praise people, when you speak well of them, what's the motivation? To get praises from them also, sometimes. That's why he told the people in 5th chapter of John, verse, 20, verse 44, John 5.44 How can you believe if you accept praise from one another but don't think obtain praise from, uh, comes from God? You're praising each other and you praise others to get praise from them. That's your motivation. So you say, pick well of people. God says, why we do that? Is it just to get a name or a wonderful person speaks nice words, always blesses people? So God examines all these seven things. Every one of us is spiritually naked before God. We can't hide from God. So, how do we go about asking God to show our hearts and also to reveal to us what pleases Him or doesn't please Him? Now we have a helper, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, who counsels us. He counsels us. He is our counselor. John 14, 16. He is also our convictor of sin. But all sin is there in the heart. He'll convict us. John 16, 8. And as we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, He will reveal to us even the beginnings of sin in the heart. In James chapter 1, 13 to 15, we read, James writes, 
when tempted, no one shall say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, or is tempted by anyone. anyone. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is fully grown, it leads to death. Between sinning, actually sinning in thought, word or deed, or having a conception of desire in our hearts, there is a time interval. When we go to God in prayer, we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, He will counsel us. He will say, my child, something is conceived in your heart. Desire is conceived in your heart. Throw it away. Circumcise it. We have got to circumcise that in our hearts. We are so careful about how what we speak, what we do for people to impress by what we speak and impressed by what we do. What about what God sees? And therefore, if you are a people pleaser, then we will only look at what we speak and what we do. If you are God pleasers, we will be careful about the inner life, the life that God sees. That's why the Lord told the Pharisees, read the chapter of Matthew, he rebuked the Pharisees for the hypocrisy. Matthew 20, chapter 25-26. Woe to you, Pharisees, this is the law, you hypocrites. You clean the outside the cup and dish, but it's not full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, outside also be clean. Cup and dish is basically the body, inside is the heart. <clears throat> Be careful about the outside appearance for people to see. You're blind, he says. God says, you're blind. See inside. Inside is clean. Outside also will be clean. We are called to circumcise our hearts. The real circumcision God wanted from the very beginning, including Old Testament time, was not just a physical circumcision. That's only symbolic. Circumcision is of the, is of the heart. Jeremiah 4, chapter verse 4, Old Testament. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts to the Lord. Not a cement. Paul writes about true circumcision. What is true circumcision? Circumcision basically means putting off, putting off, cutting off. Here is writes, what is true circumcision? Romans 2.29. True circumcision, circumcision the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, it's from God. When he circumcises all the unwanted things that God sees that people don't see, we'll put it away, that pleases God. So how do you go about it? Simply spend time with God, one-to-one. -one. Ask Him to reveal your life, your heart. In Psalm 90, verse 8, the psalmist writes, psalmist is Moses. Say, Moses told God, Lord, if I have found favor in said, teach me a way that I might know you. I want to know you more and more. Here he writes, Psalm 90, verse 8, one of the rare Psalms of Moses. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. When you go to God in prayer, what do you say? Lord, I am in your presence, Lord. Isn't that true? Early morning when you go alone to, for God, before you pray with people or families, whatever, when you spend time one-to-one -one with God, you say, Lord, I am in your presence, Lord. In God's presence, our secret sins are all illuminated. They're not concealed. They're all revealed, open to us. We can, we can know our sins. The psalmist says, Psalm Moses, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. And as we go to God, he will reveal his word to us. His word, in fact, counsels us. Just the Holy Spirit counsels us. Use the word of God to counsel us. In Psalm 119, verse 24, the psalmist says, Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. They counsel me. God's word counsels us. God's word warns us. Warns us about going away from God. Psalm 19, verse 11. By them, them meaning the words of God, your servant is warned. God's will keep us secure in God's word. Verse 11 of Psalm 119. The psalmist writes, I have in your word in my heart that I will not sin against thee. Now it's important for us to constantly have fellowship with the Holy Spirit and while we go to God in prayer one-to-one, -one, 
the early part of a prayer before we start praising God or worshiping or asking God for things, to ask Him to show our life, what He sees, what we don't see. Now we understand why David prayed to God in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if any offensive way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. What a wonderful prayer that is. All of us can pray like that. Same Lord who convicts us of sin, who counsels of sin, empowers us to come out of sin, will reveal to us the beginnings of sin in our hearts. Or already we have sin, then he will convict us. He said, Child, this is not for you. Improper for God's holy people. You know how wonderfully God speaks? He will never condemn us. If we've done something wrong and we feel bad about it, he will encourage us, encourage us to come out of us. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. Romans 2, 4. And he speak to us and say, My child, this is not for you. Improper of God's holy people. People of the world can do all these things. They do that. They don't know me. You know me. And live for me. Live to please me. You'll do well to turn from sin. How wonderfully God speaks. Never be afraid to go face up to God. The Israelites in Old Testament time, they don't want to face up to a holy God. They told the prophets, tell us present things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path. path and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah chapter 30 from verse 9 onwards. And the Lord uh, wants them to come to him and listen to his word. And verse 18, he says, Isaiah 30, 18, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to me, tries to show you compassion. People are scared to face up to a holy God. Oh, God is a holy God. I can't face up. I'm in sin. I'm in sin. I won't face up to him. They simply go to him and say, Lord, I have sinned. He will draw us out of sin. He will reveal himself as a compassionate, gracious God. Never be shy to face up to God. Anyway, you can't hide from God. Face up to him. Tell him everything. He will guide us. He'll counsel us, convict us, and very importantly, he will draw us out of sin. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. He'll purify, not just forgive and forget, he'll draw us out of sin. All of us know that. None of us can continue in sin, it's not possible. No one born of world continue to sin. 1 John 3, 9. Cannot go on sin because he is born of God. Holy Spirit draws out of sin. He is a, a Holy Spirit. Spirit of God is a Holy Spirit. He makes us holy. And therefore, always go to him and tell him everything. He will convict us, counsel us, empower us, and change our lives in a way we can never thought we can we'll ever be changed. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul writes about believers, all with the unveiled faces, reflecting God's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we have a helper, the Holy Spirit, the Word together, sanctify us. Now in spite of all the resources God has given us, sometimes we become insensitive to the Holy Spirit. Insensitive. And God used people to come and correct us. We don't listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. He will use people to come and correct us and tell us where we are wrong. So, if you want to watch your life carefully, listen to what people say. When someone corrects you, go by the content of the correction. Not who is correcting or how is correcting. Some people correct you out of, you know, to get even with you. Early you correct them, now they want to correct you. And sometimes you do it in a very rude way, holding you down. Don't go by that. They should speak politely and lovingly and not out of retaliation but to build you up. That's true. But on, as a recipient of correction, don't go by who is correcting you on what manner of speech they are correcting. Please go by the content of it. What is he saying? Is it true of me? He is telling me my weakness. Is it true? If it is true, thank God that through this person you came to know about your weaknesses. And give it to Jesus and say, Lord, change my weakness and make it a strength. Hebrews 11.34 says, Hebrews 11.34, By faith, our weakness are turned into strengths. That's why we have fellowship. 
fellowship with God's people also for us to correct each other. If you go to live alone somewhere in the corner, you don't need correction from people. You can't get correction from people. We can go our own life. But then God brings people to us who love us, who correct us. If you love someone, you correct the person. 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, 16, 17. All scriptures God breathed, used for teaching, correcting, rebuking and training in righteousness. A man of God be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, it's important that while we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, sometimes we don't listen to His voice, and He'll use God, use people to come and correct us. What do people say about you negatively? You think it's negatively, but it's correction. Go by the content of the correction. If it's true, accept it. Ask God to change you. He'll change us. Hosea will make us more and more like Jesus. Second, uh, Second Corinthians three eighteen, which I quoted earlier. Now, when someone corrects you, and it's not true of you, it's a false allegation. Ignore it. Ignore it. And before God, rejoice. If you look at fifth chapter of Matthew. 11 and 12, the Lord Jesus Christ gave a simple formula how to handle false allegations, how to respond to false allegations. You know what he says? Very fascinating passage, two verses. Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad. Forget the reward in heaven. For this is the way the persecuted prophet were before you. This is the way the persecuted prophets were before you. So when people insult you, persecute you, and make false allegations, rejoice and be glad. You begin to wonder, how can I rejoice in false allegations? Why focus on falsehood, ignore falsehood? God will indicate you when you are right. Leave it to God to indicate you. Very simple response to people correcting you. If it's true, accept it. Ask God to change you. If it's not true, ignore it. And remember, every correction is for our betterment. They may correct us just to pull us down, but God corrects us to build us up. He always builds us up. A God is an ed edifier, never a destroyer. So praise God that we can keep our life very clean before God. But remember, it's, you are called to be a God pleaser under people pleaser. So ask Holy Spirit to constantly guide you in your walk with God and Watch your life very carefully with the help of the Holy Spirit. What about doctrine? Doctrine is teaching. Doctrine basically means teaching. Sound doctrine means sound teaching. Now, as we are called to share with people what you understand, we must discern what we hear. Discern what we hear and what we read. Now, in the in a pursuit of knowing God's word and knowing God, very important not to get carried away by the pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake. Some people pursue knowledge for knowledge's sake. We read the Bible not to know knowledge of the Bible, but rather knowledge of God through the Bible. Knowing God through the scriptures. This is what Moses told God. Teach me a way that I might know you. So scriptures begin to know God more and more. While we watch our life, we have to watch our doctrine. In other words, he's given resources to watch our doctrine. Be careful about what we receive from the churches, from teaching. To discern what is from God. A very important gift there is in the Bible. 12 chapter, 1 Corinthians, verse 10. Gift of discerning of spirits. Distinguishing between spirits. We all need this gift to discern the correct teaching. Be very careful about discerning every teaching with the scriptures. When Paul went to Berea, 70 chapter Acts, verse 11, we read about the Bereans. They were noble character. For the word of God with great eagerness and examine the scriptures daily. See if Paul is saying it's true or not. As Paul spoke to the people in Berea, they were noble character, noble people. With great eagerness, they received the word of God. But they didn't get carried away by Paul's reputation. They examined the scriptures daily to see what Paul is saying true or not. So for us to discern Christ teaching, it must be rooted in God's word. Rooted in God, and his word, being rooted in God, basically being rooted in word. God's word reveals the nature of God. And say, so always say, Lord, I want to know you more and more through the scriptures. Reveal yourself. Now, knowing God means knowing the likes and dislikes of God. 
Meaning likes and dislikes. Unlike man, God does not change. Malachi 3 6. I, the Lord, do not change. And God's likes and dislikes don't change. Knowing God means knowing his likes and dislikes. He hates sin, he loves sinners. His likes and dislikes don't change. So we read the Bible, we can understand. What God likes, what God doesn't like. That's why Moses says, teach me your ways, not world's ways, your ways. I want to know your ways. God's ways and world's ways are different. God's thoughts and world's thoughts are different. So examine scriptures daily. Whenever you hear any teaching from anywhere, don't go by reputations. Great man of God is speaking. I'm going to go and listen to a great man of God. Great man of God can make mistakes because he's a man. We're all men of a great God. Praise God for that. Ordinary men of an extraordinary God. And we are prone to making mistakes. We can go by our own spirits. Sometimes people go by their own spirits, not the spirit of God. Always check scriptures. When someone when you hear the word of God, what's from God, accept it, not from God, ignore it. And we have a counselor even in that area, the Holy Spirit. He's the author of the Bible. He'll make us understand the Bible because that's his handwriting. Now, personally, I have a very bad handwriting. I always felt in my college school days and college days, I lost a lot of marks in the exam because handwriting was bad. Examiner couldn't understand what I wrote. Excuse I used to give. Very bad handwriting. And But I can read my own handwriting. I wrote it, no? I can understand. So who's the best person to interpret a bad handwriting? The one who wrote it. In the case of Holy Spirit, it's not I've had a bad handwriting. It's the, it's the best right handwriting. I'm giving an analogy. How they write with hand. So the best person to interpret the Bible is the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Many people in the world, Christians, Christian leaders, preachers, teachers, they distort the Bible. Their own pursuit of trying to please people by their extraordinary knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. First Corinthians 8 1 says, knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. When you read the Bible to gain knowledge of the Bible, a lot of data, you can get proud. That knowledge puffs up. When you read the Bible, hear the word of God to know God more and more, then you have manifested the love of God. You know God more and more, you manifest the love of God. So please read scriptures, hear scriptures to know God more and more. To listen between right and wrong, so that you can please God by the way you live. Now, while we understand many things, go and share with people, we don't run behind knowledge for knowledge's sake, I told you. The, the Lord warned the church in Thyatira about teaching of Jezebel in the Bible. Book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 23. How where they went behind her for her teaching. Her teaching misled people. And they, 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 uh, uh, they, and the church people did not go after Satan's deep secrets. Satan's deep secrets. Sometimes you want deep secrets of God's word. Satan will use it. Oh, you want deep secrets? I will teach you. Great mysteries. It's not from God. And you run behind pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake. He can, he can speak to you and you don't have discernment. With the, what a wonderful revelation I got. But go by the spirit behind that revelation. Which, from where it, has it come? Devil knows some of the scriptures he knows. He can make you run behind knowledge just to become proud. Knowledge puffs up. To make us proud, he'll give us deep secrets of Satan is written. Revelation 2, 23 and 24. And therefore, simply ask God for revelation of himself. Things of God, things of God are not searched out. They are received by revelation. Jeremiah 33, God says, Call unto me, I'll answer you. I'll show you unsearchable things you do not know. I'll show you unsearchable things. Things of God can't be searched. You can have a heart to know God more and more. A heart for God's word. But you can't do research on God. He reveals. Things of God are revealed. He reveals to people who become like children. God finds pleasure in revealing to children. As I quoted earlier. In Luke 10, 21. So have open hearts. Say, Lord, I want discernment. Discern your teaching. And Lord, keep me in the right path. Let me not run by knowledge for knowledge's sake. Help me watch my doctrine very, very closely. 
and not to tell people what they like to hear, but tell them what they need to know. What they need to know is something only you know, Lord. So let me listen to your voice and speak to people. The Apostle Paul warned Timothy about not telling people what they like to hear. He told him, he gave him a charge in First Timothy chapter 4 from verse 2. Preach the word. Be prepared in season out of season. Correct, rebook and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Great patience and careful instruction. For time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, sound teaching, that, that is. Rather, through, through their own evil desires, they gather on them teachers who tell them what the itching ears want to hear. But you, in fact, he goes on to say in the next verse, that they'll turn aside from and the truth and turn to myths. These people turn aside from truth, turn to myths. But you keep ahead in all situations, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill all duties of ministry. Keep your head. In other words, don't lose their head. Keep your head in all situations. Have a stable head. Don't get carried away by what people want. They want many things. Very extraordinary teaching they want. Deep secrets they want. But you preach the word. The truth. But these people will turn from truth, turn to myths. Don't speak myths. Speak the truth in love. A big warning for all people who are in the ministry. And all Christians, we're all in the ministry only. So it's very important that we ask God, the Holy Spirit, to reveal to us God's word and simply seek to know him more and more through scriptures. As you know him more and more, will manifest the love of God. So knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Builds us up, builds up people to be minister. It's very important to, to watch both. Ask Holy Spirit to give you a revelation about your heart, constantly, closely. If every morning I go to God in prayer, when I go to God in prayer, probably pray for other people, early morning prayers for intercession. But in the beginning of the prayer, I say, Lord, Holy Spirit, you speak to me, show me my heart. First thing in the morning, I say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, for the blood of Jesus. Holy Spirit, help me to pray and show me my heart, Lord. Like Moses prayed and said, I never did before you. Secrets and light of presence. And I tell the Lord, search my heart, show me my heart, Lord. And he reveals. The beginnings of sin he might reveal. Or there's nothing there, he'll, he'll, he won't convict. Because nothing to convict. And I thank God, Lord, since the last time I prayed till now, I haven't done anything wrong. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, you gave me strength, Lord. Have a constant communication with him. Everything. Tell him your successes, your failures, your struggles, your sorrows, your joys, pour the heart to him. And God loves to hear from us. He loves for us to talk to him. A child going to parent, telling the parent everything. We are his friends. He's our friend. Like a friend, talk to him. God spoke to Moses like a friend. Like a man speaks to a friend face to face. No wonder Moses is very frank with God. If I want favor in his head, teach me your ways. A friend of God he was. And Lord was so happy that Moses was his friend. So choose to be his friend and tell him everything. Nothing to hide. You cannot hide from God anyway. And uh, when you're honest with him, straightforward with him, come clean with him, he will forgive us and he'll pay us and put him all our He will draw us out of sin and he'll give the right teaching. The anointing will teach us all things. Both pronounce us with the word of God power of God and the word of God and I mean pouring out. He pours the word into our hearts. We must let the word of God go deep into our hearts and minds. And in 1 John 2 27, it says, anointing will teach us all things. All things anointing will teach us. Every aspect of life, not just the Bible, for your profession, for your calling, to fulfill that, anointing will teach you all things. So all of us can be people who shine for Jesus by the resource he's given us. Don't get complacent. When you get complacent, we say, oh, I'm fine. My life is okay. My, my teaching is okay. Everyone likes my teaching. But that's when you may be very, very, very careful. The thing you're standing for, be careful you don't fall. First Corinthians 10, chapter verse 12. Any one of us can stumble at any point of time. The different thing God lifts us up. Even though you fall, 
he will lift you up. If you stumble, we won't fall. He will lift us up. If we fall, he will restore us. Why fall at all? I've fallen many times, but he lifted me up. Now I'm bent on not falling. Helping God give me the early morning signs. Early warning signs, give me Lord, so I don't have to stumble at all. So wonderful to know that constantly he is in us and with us. He'll guide us in the way of holiness. So while people say nice things about you as a Christian, always ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, to watch over your life and doctrine, and always go to him. Psalm 32 was 80, right? He said actually to his people, I will instruct you and teach you the way you have to go. I will instruct you, teach you the way you have to go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Verse 9. Don't be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bread and bread, or they will not come to you. Don't be like the mule or the horse. Don't be like a donkey. Always come to me. Have fellowship with me. I will instruct you, teach you, counsel you, and watch over you. So don't feel bad about what people say about you. Like I said, what I say about you, weigh it. About a life. Also about doctrine. If they say that something you're saying is wrong, it's not according to the Bible. Be open. Be open and ask uh, the Lord, Lord, I said this, they're saying it's not wrong doctrine. Show me, Lord. God will reveal to you. Holy Spirit will reveal to you. Sometimes people come and attack you just because you are very popular in your work that you do. You know, official work, home, home, home life, you be successful, they, they be attacking you. Don't be surprised at that. Because it's out of jealousy and envy. Like I said, go by the content of the teaching. Now, it's true that among the believers, there's a difference of opinion about doctrine. In 1 Corinthians 11, 19, 1 Corinthians 11, 19 is written, nor do they have a difference among you, no doubt, there will be a difference among you, to show who has God's approval. Nor do there must be differences among God's people, to show who has God's approval. So some point, if you think differently, it says in the Bible, third chapter of Philippians, verses 14, 15, 16, 15, 16, if on some point you think differently, even that God will make clear to you. You live to what you already obtained. Uh, attain. Whatever you live up to, whatever you attain up to now, whatever you know of God, live up to it. God will make it clear to you. Don't fight about, don't be, uh, fight about doctors. If you're mature, it takes such a view of things. If on some point you think differently, God will make clear. So the difference of doctrine, don't fight the people about doctrines. Leave it to God to vindicate you. If you are wrong, he'll vindicate other person to you. If you are right, he'll vindicate you to the other person. So we have a helper who helps in every area of our life. So always watch your life and doctrine. And as you are along, as you walk with the Holy Spirit, you are in secure ground because you are rooted and built up in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for each one of us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, to give us resources, Lord, to always watch our life and doctrine with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and give us the faith to listen to your voice, Lord, and know that we are secure in your hands, Lord. You are a security, Lord Jesus. Let not anything else be a security, Lord. I thank you for every one of us, Lord. Your people are so faithful, Lord, and always hearing your word and wanting to live by you, Lord. Honor them as they honor you, Lord. And I pray each one of us to learn to watch our life and doctrine closely with the word and the spirit, Lord. We thank you, we praise you, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless us all.